Hi guys, welcome back to GK Code Labs. Hope you are all safe and inside your homes. So in this video, I have decided to discuss with you uh, some of the key points uh, as far as Spark and mostly the big data engineering is concerned. These are the few key points which are you can say as of now they are on the top of my head so I have uh, made it in few pointers. But uh, these are a few interesting things that you should try to have always on your fingertips because they might also help you in some of the interviews. So I have made a list of uh, near about 20 points and I have divided it into different categories which uh, these respective points will be focusing on. So first a uh, few points regarding the Spark architecture. These are a few interview questions that might be asked if any interviewer uh, wants to know about your knowledge on Spark architecture. This is not in very deep but just few points that are coming on the top of my head right now. So first point an interviewer might ask you that what decides the stages in a particular Spark job. Suppose uh, he says I have two jobs and if I go inside the Spark UI I see uh, some five stages in one of the job and some seven stages in another job. So what is the difference? What, uh, what, what factor is deciding it? So your clear answer or your understanding should be how the stages are created. The stages in a Spark job are created depending upon the white dependencies. Now what are white dependencies? When any RDD is being created as a result of some transformation, then the previous RDD on which the transformation has been applied if the relation of that particular RDD's partitions is one to one to the new RDD getting created, then it is a narrow transformation. Not only one to one, suppose the input RDD on which we are doing the transformation has three partitions and the output RDD, the first partition or any particular partition requires some data from one particular partition of the previous RDD and some data from the another partition. In that case that calls a shuffle operation obviously because the data has to be shuffled between the partitions. In that case this becomes a white dependency and that is where the stage gets created. And also keep in mind if any particular partition consumes the entire data from multiple partitions. Suppose partition 1 of the resultant RDD is consuming all the data from partition 1 and partition 2 from previous RDD. So obviously this is not one to one but it is still a narrow transformation. So this is just a point you should keep in mind and if you want you can dig it deep, uh, google it and for the interviewer's question you can answer that there might be more number of white transformations getting created that is resulting into more uh, stages in another job as compared to the first job. So I hope you get it. If not, please comment. I will try to explain more. But as a small pointer, just keep this thing in mind. Now another point regarding Spark or you can say Hadoop architecture only. Uh, we know that uh, in HDFS the data is stored into blocks. What if uh, some weird request comes that you want to know that a particular file, how many blocks it has got uh, stored into. So for that you can uh, make a note of HDFS command itself with a FSCK option. I'll mention it right here, HDFS FSCK with the file name along with the complete path. Another point is what if you don't want to give any configuration parameter that we give for the executors and the cores, all those configuration you don't want to give inside the code that you are building. Obviously this is a uh, good practice for not giving these uh, parameters inside the code, not hard coding it. But how will you uh, manage in ideal uh, production level Spark job? So first thing is priority wise you can take. First priority will be taken whatever configuration is given inside the code. And that we have to avoid. We should not hard code it inside the Spark job. So we are left with two more options. So first priority you should give uh, while submitting the Spark job or wherever you are scheduling it, where, wherever you are scheduling with Spark submit, there as a argument you can pass the number of cores and the uh, memory and all the parameters. If not, if uh, you are given the option that you don't want to submit while uh, submitting the job, uh, then you have another last option left uh, to set the configuration on this Spark binary level that is in the Spark env.sh. 
and all the different options you can get on the spark uh, official documentation you can go to spark documentation and find out whatever type of uh, configuration you have to do now another point regarding the same uh, suppose there is a spark job running and you want to know what were the configurations passed to this job how will you check it so for this you can go to spark ui or if you are running on yarn go to yarn uh, click on the application id inside that uh, the spark ui you can go to environments tab inside that you will find all the configuration that particular job run has considered depending upon from whatever source you have passed it to spark submit or the spark binaries or hard coded all the configurations that uh, particular job has taken will be available in the environment stack now one of the uh, interesting point and that has been also asked in couple of interviews suppose you are running your spark job on yarn and uh, for some reason the yarn ui is not working that is the uh, only the user interface is not working or somehow it has got stuck and you want to check the status of your application or the logs of your application so how are you going to figure that out so for that uh, if you are aware or not i'm not sure but we have the yarn cli mode also command line interface also and basically two commands are enough uh, for you to uh, get into the details of the job the logs and the status of the job i'll mention it right here the first command that you can use is yarn application and uh, with that you can use a list option and uh, if whatever state your if you are sure that my job was running or whatever jobs are running that you want to see or failed or killed according to that you can pass the option and if you are not sure there is a all option that you can choose and with that you can find whatever jobs are in which state and once you are sure that whatever job uh, is there and in whatever state it is you want to check the logs of it you can uh, take the application ids from this command and after that you can use yarn logs command passing the same application id and it will provide you all the uh, spark job logs and one important thing where are you going to run this command simply wherever your spark cluster is there from any of the edge nodes edge node in a sense if you are if you have any dedicated edge node uh, that is uh, perfectly fine or any of the machine that is a part of your hadoop or spark cluster i hope it is clear to you so these were some uh, spark architecture related uh, points now let's come to some scala related points for those uh, who are using scala for spark these points uh, can be helpful for you so first point that some of you might have noticed or not uh, in an interviewer might ask what is the difference between single ampersand and double ampersand both are and functions but what is the difference between them or is there any at all so yes there is a difference if you are going to use the single ampersand that is single and operation that is a logical operator what will happen as uh, we know that and operation uh, will return false if any of the condition is false there is a slight difference when you are using single ampersand uh, no matter any of the condition is false or true but all the conditions will be checked at least so if the first condition is false and another condition is uh, false again but still both the conditions will be checked on the other hand if you are using the double ampersand in that case if the false condition occurs on the first place on the left hand side then the second condition will not even be checked so hope that's clear to you it's a small point but uh, you can keep in mind another simple point uh, if you are using the scala code re readily that uh, then you might be very well aware of this but if not um, how are you, what is the difference between accessing elements of a tuple and elements of a list or an array so simply uh, the elements of a tuple in scala can be accessed by dot underscore and any uh, element of a list or an array can be accessed by the index so that was a simple thing but uh, um, for beginners uh, just keep that in mind so you don't get confused another point is uh, this is not only for scala but uh, a general map question uh, when we have a map that is a key value uh, binding if you uh, fire a contain uh, statement or you want to search in that uh, suppose like ma map name dot contains and if you pass uh, any string or any value to check is it going to check the keys of that map or the values of that map 
so just keep in mind uh, when you whenever you fire a dot contain statement on a map it is going to verify the keys not the values another scala question could be uh, is there any option to define your custom data types so yes there is an option and you can do it by using type keyword now let's come to uh, spark core uh, points key points or the interview questions suppose you have a paired rdd so how are you going to access only the keys or only the values of that paired rdd so there are many options or you can do many workarounds to get those values but uh, we already have the apis dot keys and dot values which can simply uh, get you the keys and the values from the paired rdds so that is the efficient method uh, for this now another thing could be uh, suppose you have a paired rdd how do you do a map that does the operation or the map uh, whatever function that we are writing inside map only on the values not the keys so for that you can use the map values function now next point i have heard that uh, one guy uh, was asked in one of the interviews he was asked that uh, how many partitions will be returned i mean in after transformation the resultant rdd how many partition will that get distributed to in case the input rdd has three partitions and we have six cores in our cpu so three partitions and we have the six cores uh, and we have uh, all six cores working uh, on the operation so how many partitions will the resultant rdd get distributed to so guys you might face such kind of questions but let me tell you in this the cores in the cpu that's it, that is six cores in the cpu that that statement has been given just to confuse you that doesn't matter at all if you have three partitions and if you are not mentioning explicitly to increase or decrease the number of partitions in your resultant rdd the partitions are going to be same if there are three partitions in the input rdd you will be getting three partitions in the output rdd as well given that you are not mentioning anything to uh, change the number of partitions that you can do explicitly another question in spark core uh, itself what i felt important is uh, suppose in uh, filter condition uh, as you know in rdd when you apply the filter operation what happens is it returns uh, a boolean and whatever elements uh, pass through that uh, boolean condition that means it gets true gets passed through it and other gets blocked and suppose any interviewer asks you that in the filter operation whenever the first false condition occurs i want to stop right there so whatever true conditions are there uh, that will pass whenever first false condition that 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 gets the filter blocked i want to stop the operation there itself so how are you going to do that so obviously there are many uh, workarounds you can check it inside the if conditions and uh, many multiple ways are there but there is a simple api that is take while so you can make a note of it so as you uh, as you uh, know the take api that used to fetch the uh, limited amount of data there is a take while api that also takes the similar function that the uh, filter condition takes but it will stop whenever the first fall con false condition occurs so i hope that is clear to you if not please see the spark documentation once and this will be uh, this is a very simple api and you will be clear on it mm -hmm.